Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> why do I talk about the Bauhaus today? Because today is the birthday of Walter Gropius, and I will also uh, go through, will also uh, uh, study uh, his work in detail after this presentation about the Bauhaus, and then we'll talk about his uh, privileged uh, uh, student, so to speak, uh, his uh, protege, uh, Marcel Breuer. So the Bauhaus uh, was founded in 1919 and it lasted until 1933 and it had three directors. One was Walter Gropius, the founder, the second one was Hans Meyer, and then Miss van der Rohe. And with, with Miss, uh, the, the, the school uh, ended its uh, life in Europe, but it continued uh, in some other places, uh, beginning with Chicago, but not only there. It started in Weimar in 1919, and it actually, the ideas of, of Gropius uh, were uh, connected with uh, previous ideas of educational reform that, that happened both in Great Britain and in Germany. Uh, William Morris, for example, was involved with a, with a, a proposal for educational reform uh, in Germany, there was the school that was uh, founded by uh, Henry van der Velde, a well, Belgian uh, architect, but, but he, he um, uh, was active in, in, uh, in, in Germany and he actually proposed in 1915 Walter Gropius to take over the school he was leading. And the first building of the Bauhaus was actually the building designed by Henry van der Velde. Uh, <clears throat> so, this was the building designed by uh, Henry van der Velde, and it was, it was a school of arts and crafts. And actually, I long myself to have in our country a, a school just like the university in Vienna, the University of Applied Arts, to bring back architecture in connection with painting, sculpture, ceramics, uh, textiles, and other arts, because I think the connection between architecture and other um, you know, in a way similar fields can only benefit architecture and they can be benefited, uh, can benefit themselves from the uh, conjunction with architecture. So this school, this school that uh, Gropius founded in 1919 was already based on, on, uh, um, uh, on the ferments uh, on the ideas that came to him from various uh, uh, educational uh, uh, movements, both in, in, in England and in Germany. And the, the, the aim was to bring the arts together. This was the aim. And to, to uh, erase the, the frontier between so-called major arts and minor arts. In other words, between the so-called artist and the so-called craftsman. And in the end, to create some kind of a, a union between art and technology. And Gropius was the perfect man to do this. And he did it brilliantly. But his ideas, as I said, were not totally his. He was a, a part of a continuum. Before him was Henry van der Velde, uh, was even Otto Barning involved also at the beginnings of, uh, of the art movements prior to the First World War, and then in England, William Morris and others. So this was the building designed not by Gropius, but by Henry van der Velde, and, uh, and uh, it still stands. These photographs are, you know, contemporary photographs. And in a strange way, somehow, in my opinion, the building by Henry van der Velde expresses better the conjunction of the arts than the buildings built by Walter Gropius in Dessau. And we'll, uh, it's, please keep in mind these images and then compare them with the images of the new buildings in Dessau. Again, Henry van der Velde, Henry van der Velde, this is the, 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 the Bauhaus in, in Weimar, but before the, Weimar, the, the Bauhaus was a different arts and crafts school in this building. And as I said, in 1915, Henry van der Velde uh, promoted, uh, or yes, promoted uh, Walter Gropius to take over uh, the directorship of this school. And then in 1919, Gropius uh, founded um, the Bauhaus. This is the manifesto of the, of, the, of, of the Bauhaus from 1919. And it is short, as you can see, and I will read the translation. 
and the graphic representation, the graphic, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, expression in a way of, of, of the text uh, is, uh, was done by Lionel Feininger, the only North American um, master at, 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 at the Bauhaus. Uh, and it represents, surprise, surprise, what it was called the Cathedral of Socialism. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, the Bauhaus was always involved politically. It was never neutral. It had uh, strong uh, political leanings. And even the manifesto shows this, you know, the Cathedral of Socialism. So the sacred and the profane. But it was essentially a symbolic representation of, of, of a synthesis, the synthesis of the arts in the name of spirit, but also the synthesis of people, unity, togetherness. It was a school that tried to ab abolish discriminations, differences, and so on, although it didn't succeed completely because I, 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 re I read recently that apparently uh, women were not, um, uh, were at least in part uh, discriminately against even at the Bauhaus. For example, uh, they were welcome, welcomed in the school, but they were not allowed to, uh, to attend um, the classes in architecture, only in uh, weaving, uh, ceramics, and a little bit later on in uh, metallurgy, but the, uh, um, the, for some reason, uh, Gropius in, in a rather, I would say, abusive way, uh, sorry, I have to be critical, and it's not me here. There are I have behind me critics who know uh, in, in detail what happened. Uh, didn't allow women to 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 attend um, architecture classes. Fortunately, the situation changed these days, and now we have more uh, female students than than male students, often in many architecture schools in the world. But. Let me read this short manifesto because I think it is a, a, a very telling text about what Walter Gropius stood for. <clears throat> the ultimate aim of all creative activity is a building. The decoration of buildings was once the noblest function of fine arts and fine arts were indispensable to great architecture. Today they exist in complacent isolation and can only be rescued by the conscious cooperation and collaboration of all craftsmen. Architects, painters, and sculptors must once again come to know and comprehend the composite character of a building, both as an entity and in terms of its various parts. Then their work will be filled with that true architectonic spirit, which as Salon d'Art, Salon Art, it has lost. The old art schools were unable to produce this unity. And how indeed should they have done so since art cannot be taught? Schools must return to the workshop, the world of the pattern designer and applied artist consisting only of drawing and painting must become once again a world in which things are built. If the young person who rejoices in creative activity now begins his career as in the older days by learning a craft, then the unproductive so-called artist will no longer be condemned to inadequate artistry for his skills will be preserved for the crafts in which he can achieve great things. Architects, painters, sculptors, we must all return to the crafts, to crafts, for there is no such thing as so-called professional art. There is no essential difference between the artist and the craftsman. The artist is an exalted craftsman, but by the grace of heaven and in, in rare moments of inspiration which transcend the will, art may unconsciously blossom from the labor of his hand, but a base in handicrafts is essential to every artist. It is there that the original source of creativity lies. Let us therefore create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions that raise, raise an arrogant barrier between craftsmen and artists. Let us desire, conceive, and create the new building of the future together. 
it will combine architecture, sculpture, and painting in a single form and will one day rise towards the heavens from the hands of a million workers as the crystalline symbol of a new and coming faith. Walter Gropius, 1919. Now, this is an exalted text, does, isn't it? This is almost a mystical uh, text. It's, it is an expressionistic text. This is not an international style text. This is not a mercantile text. This is not a, an utilitarian text. This is the text of a poet and of a visionary. And this must be understood. Bau, the Bauhaus was not what we think it is. It's, it essentially, at the very beginning, it was an emotionally charged school with a vision, which was in many respects uh, resp uh, spiritual. After all, you saw yourselves the word heaven twice, and it ends with the word faith and it speaks about exaltation. What school of architecture today speaks about exaltation? None, as far as I know. None is interested in bringing exaltation to students and professors alike. But Walter Gropius pointed exactly towards this, and he said clearly, the only difference between the craftsman and the artist is that the artist is an exalted craftsman. I truly think it is time to reflect again on what he said and to attempt again to bring that kind of idealism which inflames the hearts of the students and the professors alike and of architects alike and we bring exaltation back to the human spirit because without it we become bored cynical or indifferent and it would be very very sad why are we talking about Gropius and the Bauhaus? Because, because of the relevance of the work. This was the, the uh, how to call it, the logo, or the visual uh, um, uh, you know, representation of the school uh, that was designed by Oskar Schlemmer in 1919. At the center, of course, is the human being, the human profile. Um, uh, Oskar Schlemmer was a remarkable uh, um, uh, professor at the school. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about him later. This was the initial, uh, um, uh, it was a publisher seal. It, you know, the, the, the artifacts, books or whatever they made at the Bauhaus in the, in the first years uh, had this, uh, this, it was called a publisher seal or you know, and, and, and it marked, uh, it was a sign of identity for whatever it was produced at the Bauhaus. Uh, again, uh, Oskar Schlemmer with, uh, with um, uh, you know, his uh, vision about, uh, you know, a, a graphic symbol for the school. And it inspired me so much that in my own, uh, maybe uh, uh, pathetically solitary uh, way, uh, I tried myself to uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, prolong the visions of Bauhaus through my own activity. So you'll see, I, I did something similar, not consciously. At that time, I was not conscious, but uh, uh, you see here, I, I, I use something similar to like, a, you know, a, a seal or a logo for uh, art and architecture gallery I opened in Evanston, Chicago uh, for five or six years. And here you see, <laughs> The, the one man uh, the one man Bauhaus that uh, I tried to uh, to make there it was at, at the, in, a, in a suburb of uh, of Chicago and here with a, with a shadow of a beautiful tree in front of the uh, of the place and through the windows you see some uh, um, you know some uh, archicad exercises uh, that uh, I uh, indulge in uh, in the name of skyscrapers. Anyway, but going back to Bauhaus, we look now at the, at the um, this is the curriculum in a way. This is what it was. It was first of all, it was circular, circular. It was not rectangular. It's very simple now. At the beginning, I mean, at the core, in the heart of it is building, site, testing, design, building and engineering science. And then the next circle, the material. 
down this kind if you are some kind of yeah, turn the microphone over turn off the microphone thank you please turn off the microphone thank you unless you want to say something so stone wood metal textiles color glass clay and then around it we see the study of materials and tools study of nature study again of materials st space study color study composition study and study of construction and representation and the uh, the outskirts so to speak of the circle basic course basic course and elementary study of form study of materials in the basic workshop so in the first year they actually started from the periphery and they moved towards the center it was very simple uh, and it worked it worked brilliantly so now we go from weimar so the school in weimar lasted from 1919 to 1925 when the school moved to dessau dessau being uh, the the town uh, or the city where which uh, uh, invited uh, the bauhaus to uh, find uh, find uh, a place there it was all for political reasons that they moved and in Dessau, uh, Gropius uh, built uh, the new buildings for the school. We see now some of the masters of the school on the roof uh, of, of the new building that Gropius built. Gropius is in the middle with a cigar, cigarette and with a dark uh, hat. With another hat not far away is uh, Vasily Kandinsky, the great Russian uh, uh, abstract painter. In, in between them is Marcel Breuer, the young, brilliant man born in Hungary. Then uh, on the left of Kandinsky is the great, brilliant uh, Swiss painter, Paul Klee. Then on his left, Lionel Feininger. Then on the left, uh, Lionel Feininger, the only woman and the only one who took her hat off. And I, I, I think it's important to notice this, Günther Stölzl. And uh, I, this is Moholinogi. Uh, another brilliant artist, trained is initially as a lawyer, and uh, I don't know the others. Anyway, this picture moves me a lot, because here we have, this is what you have when you have a group of brilliant people, and they were brilliant, uh, conducting an experiment, because the Bauhaus was an experimental school that continuously renewed itself, and when it couldn't do it any long, longer, it stopped, but in 13 years, almost 14, it changed the world and it continues to change the world. Uh, so these are these are these were the buildings built by uh, Gropius. Please uh, remember the building built by Henry van der Velde. You know, in a kind of strange way, the buildings by Walter Gropius express less the unity of the arts as that building from uh, the early years of, of the 20th century. But on the other hand, we have to acknowledge that in 1925, these buildings were strikingly original. After all, Villa Savoie was built in 1928. So, uh, you know, three years after Gropius built this complex of buildings. Uh, so Gropius at that time was a, was a very skillful negotiator between the world of art and the world of society in general. And you need such great, great negotiators in order to be able to accomplish what he accomplished, even for a short period of time. Um, housing. I will, I will show some houses he built for the masters and some houses built for the students. Well, it's actually a dorm. The master's houses. Remarkable white uh, modern building or modernistic buildings. Uh, usually two masters lived in the same building, kind of with two separate different entrances. Uh, you see the buildings are, uh, if such buildings are built today, meaning 100 years later, they would be published on Arch Daily. Well, they were built in 1925. But they have been refurbished, of course, but uh, essentially these are the buildings that Walter Gropius uh, designed and built in 1925. 
uh, there is a difference, although in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the atmosphere at the school, um, uh, there was equality between professors and students. They were kind of colleagues, they were friends, they were like a family. Yet in terms of the housing, uh, um, you know, uh, specific specificity, so to speak, there were differences. The masters lived uh, more comfortably in larger buildings and the students in a dorm. But I guess certain differences cannot be uh, really, uh, be, uh, cannot be uh, eliminated. The students' houses. Well, this is the students' houses, but it is still luminous and they, at least they have balconies and uh, there is that modernism, that fresh modernism, which I'm sure made them very, very, very happy and very proud to be students in this, uh, in this uh, innovative and experimental school. It was really a school which attempted a reform, a reform in education, and it achieved it. It achieved it in various ways, uh, uh, and not the least through the fact that it attempted and it, it uh, obtained uh, some, some kind of a meeting between industry and art. And uh, uh, this is not easily done, but they were able to do it. If you visit Germany after the pandemic, you can actually spend the night here. They rent rooms in the dorm uh, of, the, of the former students of the Bauhaus. Uh, the Bauhaus wa was also immensely influential in the field of graphics in the field of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, publishing books and, uh, and, uh, and posters and so on. Uh, the, the distinctiveness of the, of the, of the Bauhaus uh, graphics uh, made uh, the school uh, famous when uh, other means were less, um, uh, less capable to do so. Here is the handsome uh, Walter Gropius. Hello, Mr. Gropius. Of course, he didn't have a diploma in architecture. He didn't need one. Uh, he was the son of an architect, but he never finished his studies, nor did Miss, for that matter, uh, the, the third director of, of the Bauhaus. And uh, yet they were received very warmly in the United States and also in Europe. And uh, as we know, if we talk about four great masters of the modern movement in the 20th century, Gropius and Miss are there. Um, and uh, anyway, let's uh, contemplate for a second this uh, quotation from Walter Gropius. Only work which is the product of inner compulsion can have spiritual meaning. Walter Gropius. Uh, again, what kind of architect or professor, educator, would talk about spiritual meaning today? Very rarely we can find such, such, such persons. The word spiritual is uh, forgotten most of the time. Also, inner compulsion, what does that mean? But this, this quotation from him was an early one when Gropius wrote that manifesto. Uh, at that time, he was doing works like this one, which is cl clearly expressionistic. But we'll, this is a very short presentation of the masters of the Bauhaus, and then we'll look into detail of his work. Uh, after this um, um, uh, presentation of the school. Johannes Eaton. Johannes Eaton was in a way the black sheep of the, of, of the school. He was the one who actually was uh, kind of forced to leave after two or three years, although the students loved him, but because the school became increasingly uh, um, interested in um, you know, in uh, pragmatics and functionalism, uh, the 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 basic the basis on uh, on on uh, spirituality and even esotericism, which Eaton uh, exemplified, was weakened. So he became uh, uh, a little bit uh, uncomfortable for the school. This was the man. I mean, he looked like a monk. In fact, he advocated a so-called Mazda's nun technique. Uh, for a healthy living, uh, which was uh, uh, at least in part uh, of a spiritual uh, order. The students who were following it and were, uh, were wearing this kind of monkish uh, clothes, like cloaks, long, heavy cloaks, 
there was nothing actually very modern. And even the, you look at the man, uh, now you could say that I could have some sympathy towards him because my coiffure is kind of similar with uh, his. Um, uh, Eaton represented the, the mystical side of, 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 of the Bauhaus and uh, in three years actually he, he was um, uh, kind of forced to, forced to leave. He did, he worked in the theory of colors. He was a painter and, uh, and um, uh, understood at the very beginning he had a very important role at the Bauhaus and the students loved him. Now, Lionel Feininger, the, the, the only North American, but he had uh, rooting in, in Germany. His, his uh, grandparents and, and parents were German, but he was born in the United States. He did the, uh, he did the, the graphic uh, manifesto uh, that accompanied the, 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 the words of Walter Gropius, as you saw, it was this one, the Cathedral of, of, of Socialism. I show now two paintings by him. And if you are interested in his work, of course, you can find a lot uh, on the web. Another painting by Feininger. This was brilliant from, from Gropius. He brought together people who were very different from each other. He was able to, 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 to he was a, 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 an incredible catalyst. And uh, he was like a great uh, orchestra conductor or a great film director. He was able to, to, to negotiate between different personalities. Gerhard Marx, he was a sculptor, a very different artist from Johannes Eaton and, uh, and uh, Feininger. This was the man uh, and some uh, three sculptures by him. What is very interesting, this was supposed to be a school of architecture, uh, at least kind of. Well, at the beginning, there were no architects who taught there except Gropius. All the others were artists. There were no architects. Architecture came later, after moving to Dessau. And actually the, the, uh, the, 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 the young Marcel Breuer became involved there and then Miss came in 1930. But uh, for a good number of years, the famous architecture and design and arts book, uh, uh, Bauhaus, didn't have a, uh, um, a proper uh, um, architectural curriculum. Before uh, Miss, there was actually Hans Meyer from 1927 to 1930, and he, he did indeed bring, bring in uh, architecture in, a, in an intensive way. But between 1919 and 1927, uh, architecture was, was referred to almost obliquely. Uh, and, and, uh, and yet the school produced brilliant architects. Uh, surprising, no? How come? Well, it happened. Vasily Kandinsky. But these were, uh, these were uh, brilliant minds. I mean, Kandinsky, Paul Klee, they were almost like Renaissance men. Kandinsky wrote a book about the spiritual in art. Paul Klee, you can find on the web the, the notes. Uh, of, of, they are like Leonardo's. Uh, uh, Paul Klee was a very capable man of, of, uh, of conceptualizing and expressing uh, sophisticated thoughts in a very articulated way. Vasily Kandinsky, the Russian prince, you know, this is what Walter Gropius uh, hired, you know, a Russian prince, a great abstract uh, uh, painter, brought him in the school. Now, of course, a school with such professor would be would 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 would, would create creativity. That's what these people did. They created creativity uh, because they were themselves highly creative. You know, Kandinsky is one of the major artists of the 20th century, and so is Paul Klee. Uh, uh, I mean, you can only imagine what those students felt when when the professor entered the class, so to speak, you know, uh, a major artist, and they knew. Also, the Bauhaus was a very cosmopolitan school. It was open to anyone from any part of the world. And I understood it didn't, it did, they didn't have an exam to enter, and it was open, it, it, it was not uh, restricted to a certain prior education or anything. It was literally based on the on the desire to, to attend the school 
and uh, maybe there was some kind of a, uh, you know review of, of uh, you know the 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 innate or uh, or less innate uh, qualities of the person i don't know but it was a school that it was uh, very unconventional from all points of view this was uh, paul clay one of the painters i love and uh, miss van der rohe also loved him so much so that in his apartment in Chicago, Miss Van der Rohe had paintings, small paintings by this great poet of painting, uh, Paul Klee. Uh, he died at 60, but he a brilliant man. And uh, I, I, I suggest to you, if you are interested to, to check his work out on, on the web. Um, he became good friends with Kandinsky and uh, I mean, there are books written about them both. I keep saying art will save architecture. We cannot allow any longer to be continuously dried out by, uh, uh, by concerns which are uh, devoid of, of, of the sensitivity and the emotions that art brings to our lives. It's important, I think. And again, if someone says architecture is not art, then I would say open any history of art and architecture is there. Why is it there if it is not art? Open any book with a history of science and architecture is not there. Why? Because it is not science, but, but architecture is or could be art, yet it is different from being an art. It is a different kind of art, it is true, because of its utilitarian side. And I don't totally agree with, with, with Brinkush, I kept saying it, because Brinkush said that uh, um, a building is an inhabited sculpture. I, I, I wouldn't agree with this. Architecture is different uh, from, from, from being just an inhabited sculpture, but a sculptural quality to a building is useful. Günther Stelzel, the only master woman, the only woman who was a master of a department, the department of weaving, and the latest evaluate, the latest, the latest presentation of, uh, of uh, diplomas of, of uh, the final works at SciArc in Los Angeles was exactly around this theme, architecture and weaving. So isn't it strange Women were considered unable to do architecture, so they were sent to weaving, even in the progressive school named the Bauhaus. But almost one, in fact, 100 years later, in one of the most progressive schools in the world, SciArc, plenty of women architects uh, presented their thesis on architecture and weaving. So it's kind of like a revenge of weaving and the revenge of women. Very nice, I think. Uh, in the end, as we say in Romanian, the oil comes to the surface. This, uh, this uh, woman who was the only one who took her hat off on that picture on the terrace of the building in Dessau ran the weaving department. And uh, I keep saying it, weaving is part, uh, is at the very essence of the word architecture and architect because texture comes from text, T-E-K-S, which in the Indo-European, uh, Proto-Indo-European language means to weave. So the textiles were part of the very word, all the branches of the word architecture derive from this root, text, T-E-K-S, which means to weave. Uh, we still have uh, the word, uh, you know, uh, urban, uh, urban tissue or, uh, you know, uh, in Romanian even, you know, uh, we have Tsesut uh, Urban and so on, but there is more to it. Um, so this is Günther Stölzel, and this is now another, I cannot avoid the word brilliant, Oskar Schlemmer, I, I love Oskar Schlemmer, he was the choreograph. And yes, he did, you remember the, the effigy, the, the seal of the Bauhaus, but he also created these funambulesque, uh, you know, uh, costumes and uh, choreographed the, the great, the, the Bauhaus was also very interested in the theater and the stage design was 
was kind of almost like a metaphor for the world. And, and so, the, uh, so the Bauhaus expressed itself very joyously. This was also something that I have to, I have to, I have to not forget. They understood that creativity means work plus play. You cannot create until, until, unless you also play. If you are not playful, you are just rigidly concerned with the so-called work, you, you are devoiding uh, the heart of creativity of something very important. The Bauhaus understood that they need to play and they played constantly, the students with the professors together. And this is one photograph testifying about this. I mean, look at this, that the costumes are very original and striking even for today. Uh, this is another one, Oscar Schlemmer. You know, my heart beats quicker when I see these images because yes, here we are dealing with something which transcends time. This was done 100 years ago, but, but we cannot deny that there is a, a newness. Yes, even a newness about this image which was, um, you know, generated uh, 100 years ago, or this one as well. I wish the architect today would be just like this, a courageous defender of culture and of spirit, and not a slave. Marcel Breuer, we'll talk about him in detail in a few minutes. Uh, here he was, the young man from Hungary. Hello, Mr. Breuer. Uh, his birthday will be actually on the 21st of May. So that's what I thought we could have this presentation kind of called from Walter Gropius to Marcel Breuer. Uh, the famous Vasily chair, well, the name was uh, given after he produced it and offered the copy. Uh, he made a second one in his room, in his, I don't know if apartment or in his studio, and offered it to Vasily Kandinsky, but initially it had a different name. Anyway, now it is called in the world of design, the Vasily chair or the Kandinsky chair. Uh, and this is a building in the States. We are going to we'll go in, uh, in detail, uh, at, at, uh, we'll, we'll look at, in, at it in detail. And the uh, Whitney Museum of American Art in Manhattan, also built by Breuer who had a, a, a remarkable uh, career uh, in the United States. Laszlo Moholinogi, uh, another great uh, artist who continued uh, the Bauhaus in Chicago with the new Bauhaus. Here was the man, unfortunately, he died rather young, at 50 something, uh, and uh, uh, show some photographs. He was a great uh, uh, abstract, abstractionist or abstract uh, photographer but he also did uh, kinetic uh, sculptures and we are going to see, well, some kinetic, some not kinetic, but there is movement like in this one, obviously. Isn't it beautiful that a man who was trained as a lawyer becomes a master at the Bauhaus and does this sculpture, you know? Uh, perhaps, perhaps Walter Gropius was right. Art cannot be taught. Someone who is born to be an artist can become an artist even if he or she is not taught to do art. Uh, look at uh, Moholinoki, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, it's a stunning sculpture. And uh, by today's standards, as well as when it was made. And another, uh, you know, kind of a montage or some kind of a editing manipulated photograph that he did then we arrive at uh, Miss van der Rohe, uh, who changed his name from his father's name to his mother's name. Rohe is his mother's name. And Miss actually means in translation, lousy. So this who you would uh, translate uh, correctly, lousy van der Rohe, um, uh, an interesting German uh, architect and uh, serious and uh, intense. And this was uh, uh, an early work by him uh, that was expressionistic. And we are going to look at it in detail later on. And then the Crown Hall in, in, uh, in Chicago, where the School, uh, School of Architecture of the Illinois Institute of Architecture is. Uh, and uh, of course, the famous villa. I don't even have to name it. I'm sure everybody knows it. So uh, a few more images about the Bauhaus. 
uh, the way you see the name Eaton with with big letters, he was uh, he was a force at the Bauhaus, but um, uh, unfortunately, uh, after three years, he he left the Bauhaus, and. Uh, you know, images, I mean, uh, choreographies uh, done by Oscar Schlemmer. Again, playfulness. That book, Homo Ludens, states clearly you cannot create until you, unless you play. The Homo Ludens is a creator of culture. If you deprive work from playing, uh, you cannot create. And this they understood at the Bauhaus. You, 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 you can see, you know, it, it was a continuous invention. And work was pleasant exactly because it was married with playing. You know, it was it was a, it was pleasant to work in such a way. You know, and I wonder how many of us work in the in similar ways. You know, why is it that we removed pleasure from work that is playing? We saw this one uh, again. Another picture here is Schlemmer in the center. You see students and professors together playing, uh, dancing, uh, inventing with hat or without hat. Beautiful. Of course, it was a small school, uh, you know, but uh, uh, the, the intimacy, the, the organic relationship between professors and students, it was really a phenomenon, this school. How else are we to describe it? Here they are, you know, and uh, I don't know, at the end of a year, I guess. From what I read on Wikipedia, surprise, surprise, it seems only 70 people graduated, so to speak, from the school, are alumni from the school. It's hard for me to believe that only 70. But nevertheless, I'm sure it is a small number of students. So how come we still talk about the Bauhaus when they had only 70 alumni and they lasted for only 14 years? Well, maybe the explanation is not difficult. It was about quality, not about quantity. It was about creativity, not about making money, not about calculations. It was really something amazing what they were able to do then between 1919 and 1933. And really, it uplifts my, 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 my spirit to contemplate this school. And, and I believe, Sooner or later, uh, something similar will come into being. In fact, I read that, um, I don't know if she's the president of the, uh, the European government, Ursula von der, uh, I don't even know her full name. Unfortunately, she said that she wants, once the pandemic is gone, to, to create a new Bauhaus all over Europe. Europe to distinguish itself from the other continents through uh, an intensely uh, encouraged and practiced Bauhaus spirit. I don't know how that will happen or if it might happen, but I think the goal is, uh, is a noble one because really it's about culture, it's about spirit, it's about creativity, it's about art, it's about something that makes us forget all the misgivings of a boring and dry and exhausting uh, uh, mercantile life. Anyway. A world has been destroyed. We must seek a radical solution. This is what Walter Gropius wrote in 1918. The final goal of all artistic activity is architecture. Walter Gropius in the Bauhaus Manifesto, 1919. They were visionaries. These people were visionaries. They, after the calamity of the First World War, they wanted to renew the world. They wanted a rebirth. And uh, uh, as such, they succeeded. The Bauhaus, the Bauhaus, look at them, you know, playing, playing. It was truly exactly that spirit of uh, exaltation that uh, Gropius exalted himself in the short manifesto that he wrote. Uh, yeah, this was by Oscar Schlemmer. And now, sorry, this was part of a different, uh, we'll talk about Vienna rebellion, the rebellious uh, Vienna, uh, maybe in, in uh, some other time, maybe next week, who knows. Now I, I will go to Walter Gropius, uh, as I promised, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see his work in detail, because it is his birthday today. He was born on uh, May 18th, 1883, Walter Gropius. Here he is, the, here he is. 
uh, and uh, here he is with his wife. Um, yeah, here he is in front of, a, of an apartment building he built in Berlin, and we are going to see it. Uh, Now, there are voices that, uh, of course, there is always, no one escapes a certain controversy. Some people think he, I mean, he made himself his mistakes, like, uh, you know, when he sent the women to study weaving and didn't accept them in the architecture. But at the beginning, there wasn't even an architecture department. It, 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 uh, it happened later on, after 1925. So, you know, no one is above blame really uh, we are not gods we are human beings we have weaknesses we make sometimes errors but all in all he 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 was a, uh, he is a, an important uh, participant uh, in the in the in the field of culture uh, modern culture here he is with a with a drawing for the chicago tribune uh, competition where he uh, entered but he didn't win uh, and um, another picture of him and another picture of him um, and uh, I, I think we need visionaries and maybe most importantly in education because I strongly believe Erasmus of Rotterdam was right education is the most important thing for a nation if 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 the youth is educated properly that nation can prosper but if education is deficient then things cannot happen well for that nation. I think Erasmus of Rotterdam knew what he was talking about. And so did Walter Gropius. He understood that's why he invested the school with so much intensity and visionary spirit. Because indeed, education is very, very, very important. Some drawings. I read that he always worked with another architect who drew because he didn't. And it's true. Walter Gropius, one of the masters of the modern movement in architecture, he didn't draw. Uh, it's true, he always worked with another architect and that architect drew, which shows, which shows that it's possible to be a, a, an excellent architect without actually having the ability to draw. And there are people who draw very well and they are not brilliant architects. So, I'm not saying that to draw is a handicap. No, it's good if you know if you if you if you if you have the ability to draw well, uh, it could help your architecture. But it's not a condition uh, that uh, without it uh, you will you will collapse. Obviously, uh, he didn't collapse. He was of course he used someone else, but um, you know like like a conductor. A conductor doesn't necessarily need to play an instrument and can still be a brilliant conductor. Uh, Walter Gropius uh, uh, didn't draw, but he built uh, uh, some sim significant buildings. So this is a drawing, but we don't know if he did it or someone you know, working with him from 1926, uh, he was already in Dessau for the Bauhaus school. Uh, it's possible somebody, somebody did the drawings. I, I usually start presenting personalities in architecture, first with photographs and then with drawings. That's why we look at some drawings. The competition entry for the Palace of the Soviets in Moscow in 1931, where uh, Le Corbusier participated too. And, you know, they were naive. They, they thought that, you know, uh, um, the new, uh, the Soviet Union uh, would, would need uh, uh, novelty and the new and modernity and actually what was chosen was uh, you know so-called uh, classicist uh, uh, classicist architecture and but what can you do the the political uh, um, insertions uh, into the heart of uh, art or architecture can be problematic and complex and uh, the house I'm horn 1923 um, he worked here again. He didn't. He didn't do this drawing by himself. But um, anyway, he did the house, and I understood the house still exists. 
And then the submission for the palace of the Soviet competition, we already talked about it. This is another view, uh, which was not, he lost, he lost competitions. He lost this one, he lost the one in Chicago. He lost maybe, maybe not as many as Jean Nouvel. I have heard myself Jean Nouvel saying, I'm the architect who lost the most competitions in the world ever. I don't know if it's true. In fact, I just saw today uh, some towers, two towers that are redefining the skyline of Paris built by Jean Nouvel. Jean Nouvel, who indeed, uh, nomen est omen, his, no, his name means, uh, you know, uh, Nouvel is, is, uh, is the new, is bringing the new. Um, anyway, project for a total theater, 1927, uh, Walter Gropius. It was not built, but many architects of the, of the highest uh, ranking, uh, they, they created projects that uh, were never built. It's okay, an architect can, can, can express himself, herself, even just through projects, sometimes even through projects that nobody asked for. It's okay, that, uh, that um, uh, inner compulsion that Gropius talked about almost forces you to do so. Because, because you, if you have the heart of an architect, you cannot do otherwise. Now we arrive at an early work built by him and is a, is a brilliant work, the Fagus Factory from 1910, 1911. So it was eight years before the, the, the uh, founding of, uh, of the Bauhaus. Now this work, you know, is it from 1910? Is it from 19... Uh, 80, is it from 2010, you know, it, it, it could, yes, yes, you could approximate, plus you know it, it's from the beginning of the 20th century, but still it has a modernity that didn't really age. Uh, it's a factory, but, uh, you know, a factory doesn't mean that it cannot be architecture, it can very well, and there are brilliant uh, uh, architectural achievements uh, uh, arrived at uh, within this program, a factory. So this was from 1910, 1911. Now, 1914, at the Werkmund exhibition in Köln, in Cologne, in Germany. How sad that what they built there, and there was also the glass pavilion by Bruno Taut. This was, there was also a theater built by uh, Henry van der Velt, who built the first building of the Bauhaus. They were destroyed a few months after they were built. Why? Because the First World War started. Isn't it sad? Talent, work, investments, genius even, ravished ravished by the beginning of that calamity we call war. When are human beings going to stop having wars? When? This was the building, another great building by Walter Gropius. I mean, there are incredible things here. Just think of it, 1914, look at this staircase. Look at what is going on here. Uh, uh, and it, it was destroyed a few months after it was built in 1914. Uh, it's very, very sad. And uh, I remember in an interview that, uh, uh, Walt, uh, that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright gave, at, uh, he was 85, 87, I don't know, uh, over 85. And he was asked something about the, 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 the American army. And he said, if you don't intend to have war, why, why do you produce arms? And why do you continue to arm yourselves? You know, and uh, I think the question by Frank Lloyd Wright was totally legitimate. Those people who think they create the nuclear bombs in order to defend peace, they are- uh, Hi, are there any, any interesting places to go and leave? I'm and turn off the microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Sorry, I have to do this. Oh. 
I'm sorry, but uh, some people do this. They don't realize that, you know, uh, I talk freely and it's uh, any noise could uh, imbalance me more than I already am. Uh, I, I, I don't want to make too many mistakes. So uh, let me see if I didn't. Uh, okay, so we continue. This building by Walter Gropius was destroyed uh, and not by the world by the people who built them. I don't know exactly why they did that, but uh, they decided to, 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 di to dismantle the, the exhibition. And uh, it's not just this building, as I said, that great uh, glass pavilion by Bruno Taut was also destroyed and the building by Henry van der Velt and so on. Said, at least they took some pictures, it's still something. 1910, uh, no, 1914. Uh, we, just, we just looked uh, two days ago uh, at, uh, at the museum that IMP built in Berlin. Well, if we look at the, the stair, in essence, not very different from what Gropius did in 1914. The monument to the March dead, uh, he collaborated with Alfred uh, for about 1920, 1922. This we already saw a picture of, and is, it is expressionistic. At that time, the Bauhaus war, was already functioning, was already uh, founded. Uh, so here we see uh, Walter Gropius, who also is uh, kind of a sculptor, you know, an architect sculptor. And how else could have been? I, we read the manifesto where he advocated the cause of the conjunction between all arts, architects, painters, sculptors. This is how he talked to us. And why is it that we don't do this any longer? You know, why is it that we don't uh, collaborate with artists, with sculptors on a continuous basis? You know, it, it would be a great benefit to society, to the artists themselves who are often struggling. Uh, and I don't know why we divorced architecture from sculpture, from painting, even from textile work and other forms of art, of course. Even the new ones, you know, uh, the cinematographic work, uh, other medias and so on, it would, they would benefit architecture and architecture would benefit them. Okay, so this is the monument he built in, uh, in the 1920s, 1921, 1922, uh, Walter Gropius. That bench is not his. <laughs> okay. But we see that expressionistic aspiration for, for, for the above, the one that uh, three years earlier or two years and so earlier uh, was uh, externalized through words in his manifesto. Now, a house in Berlin from 1921, which he designed with Adolf Sommerfeld. Uh, can you imagine? So this was from 1921, four years before he designed those modernistic white buildings in Dessau. But this is a building that is still immersed in tradition, in arts and crafts, with the touches of uh, slight expressionism. And can you imagine this was Walter Gropius? Look at this stained glass windows inside the house. I, it is my intuition and my belief that, that somehow Walter Gropius who wrote that manifesto and who wanted the conjunction of all the arts was kind of closer to that unity between the arts uh, uh, in his early work than in his later work, and particularly the works he did in the United States. I mean, look at this stained glass window. Here it is, we see architecture plus the, the craftsmanship involved in the making of the stained glass windows. And, uh, you know, the plastic art is, uh, is associated organically to, to architecture. Look at this interior. It's hard to believe. You know, the same man who is considered today the promoter of functionalism and, uh, you know, kind of clean uh, uh, international style architecture and design. Well, here we see something else. 
I understood, and I don't know if it is true, but I read the former director of the Architectural Association in London said in a, in a conference in Vienna, in Vienna, in Austria, that uh, apparently Walter Gropius was, uh, was uh, kicked out, to use a non-academic language of the Bauhaus, by the students. Why? Because they dislike the fact that he banished history and the study of history at the Bauhaus. But we see here that, that, that Gropius was not against history at all. In fact, this building is rather immersed in history and even in the so-called tradition. I don't know if it's true, but that's what uh, Mr. Steele, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, uh, the former director of uh, Architectural Association said that Gropius was forced to leave and that's when Hans Meyer came in 1927. Okay, so uh, a man of complexities. I mean, look, even at the, sorry for the resolution, but the graphic representation of the house has that kind of exaltation that was uh, uh, talked about and illustrated in the manifesto that we saw. Now we look at the uh, competition entry for the Chicago Tribune Tower in 1925, 22, which he didn't win. And all of a sudden, the big transformation, this building, <laughs> has nothing to do with the building that we just saw. He didn't win. And maybe paradoxically to an extent, the one who won did a neo-Gothic building and that was built. Adolf Loss didn't win either. There were some important entries and some years later, Chicago initiated another competition, a second round of proposals for the uh, Chicago Tribune in the eighties. Anyway, here we see some, I hope I have, yes. Um, here they are. The building on the left was built. I don't know who designed this one. This is Adolf Loss and this is Walter Gropius. Um, uh, Bruno Taut also sent an interesting uh, scheme, so to speak, uh, uh, not a neo-Gothic, but, but kind of a modern Gothic, if I am to express myself in an oxymoronic way. Uh, here he is, um, the handsome German with his tower, <laughs> you know, the tower that lost. Uh, the Bauhaus school and the houses, we already saw some images, but uh, I, they are included in this presentation as well. 1925, 1932. Um, yeah. Now, do we see here the conjunction of all the arts? Personally, I don't. I see the architect and yes, within the building, there were uh, attempts at uh, uniting the arts in a certain way, but the building itself, I wouldn't say that it represents that unity of all the arts. Where is the painter here? Where is the sculptor? Not explicitly. They are not present explicitly at all, unless we take into consideration the redness of that door. <laughs> but I don't think that would be enough, would it? Anyway, they are still good buildings and uh, I'm happy that they were not destroyed by, by the deadly Second World War. We escaped one war, then another war came and uh, the human beings never stop destroying themselves. We see in uh, here uh, the old, so to speak, and here the new, <laughs> and there is a distance between them, but uh, maybe we can negotiate somehow, maybe. The Bauhaus Meisterhauser, we already saw uh, this. I don't know what uh, what master lived here. In fact, two masters. Um, the Gropius House, at least we identified the Gropius House and here it is. Um, not bad. I mean, after all, he was the founder. It is said that the shoemaker cannot make shoes for himself. Well, it seems the architect can make a house for himself, although Ingels Bjarke Ingel said that uh, the, the, the reason why architects are reluctant to, to build for themselves is because they cannot, uh, uh, in case of a failure, they cannot, uh, you know, uh, uh, explain the fa failure except through themselves. And thus uh, it is hard 
for architects to build for themselves. But it wasn't hard for Walter Gropius, and it wasn't hard for uh, Marcel Breuer either, who built several houses for himself. We are going to see them. Anyway, now the house for Muche Schlemmer. Uh, so we talked about Schlemmer, less about Muche. They lived here, not bad at all. I mean, the, the masters, the, I don't know how, how Walter Gropius obtained the funds to build these buildings, but he did. And um, the masters lived quite well. We have, to, we have to acknowledge it. In a nice ambiance, Kandinsky and Claire, they lived together and they became excellent friends. Um, yes, two of the greatest artists of the 20th century lived in this uh, house for a number of years. I think, uh, I think in uh, Paul Klee uh, was with the Bauhaus until 1932. And uh, I think uh, Kandinsky as well. Uh, now the housing estate in Dessau, this was not for the, for the Bauhaus uh, uh, students, 90 or, or, or teachers from 1926 to 1928. Um, you know, a fresh white modernism that uh, expressed confidence in the future and in, the, in, in, in modernity. And they still exist. But as I said, they were not built for the Bauhaus community. But for the people of, of Dessau. Now, 1936, in 1930, what happened was this. Uh, maybe I didn't explain very well. From 1919 to 1927, the school was uh, led by Walter Gropius. In 1927, uh, Hans Meyer became the director and he led the school until 1930. He was accused of being a Bolshevik, of uh, sympathizing too intensely with the Russian, with the, with the Soviets. He was uh, banished and then Miss van der Rohe came in 1930 and the schools lasted until 1932 when they moved to Berlin. They moved also because of political reason and in Berlin they uh, occupied an abandoned uh, tele telephone, uh, you know, the, uh, an abandoned building that belonged to a telephone company just for a year. And in 1933, they begin to emigrate uh, to other countries or to the United States. So in 1936, Walter Gropius worked with Edwin Maxwell Fry in England, in Cambridge. So he arrived, he already left Germany. Uh, and uh, he built a few buildings in England. This is one of them. Uh, or an addition is not very clear to me, but uh, he worked here together with that British architect. Uh, and then in, uh, in, uh, he built something from 1936 to 1966. Uh, 1936, I don't know what, no, no. 66 is the number of the building on Old Church Street in Chelsea, in London. Um, this is again Walter Gropius in London. And, and uh, now the Gropius house in 1937, he crossed the ocean and he actually took Marcel Breuer with him. He was accepted to lead the uh, Department of Architecture at Harvard, while Miss van der Rohe was invited to lead the architecture department at uh, uh, or the school itself, the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And, and, uh, and Breuer, uh, the young uh, Marcel Breuer, the younger, I think there was a difference of 19 years between Gropius and Breuer, but Gropius had great confidence in, in Breuer. So he took, he took him with him to, uh, to the United States. And this is a house that he built for himself, Gropius uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and it's not bad uh, at all. In my opinion, uh, and not just mine, I, I read other essays and articles. Um, the more he stayed in the United States, the more uh, he, 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 he founded a firm called Architects Collaborative. And so it was in the spirit of, of a team that he always advocated 
uh, not because he didn't, he couldn't draw, but he, he was genuinely interested in collaboration in, uh, in uh, teamwork. But I think some of his works in the States are not as uh, intensely innovative uh, and as fresh as the ones he did in, uh, in Europe and even his early works in the United States. But this house is good. And he built one also with Marcel Breuer, which is excellent. And uh, Kenneth Frampton loves it too. Uh, we'll arrive at it. Well, yes, it is the white box, but this uh, canopy and uh, cantilever and uh, I mean, the entrance has, has a touch of expressionism. So the diagonals create that, uh, uh, that uh, rebelliousness, if you want, formally speaking, that is uh, benefiting um, the aesthetics of the building. He lived comfortably, yes. I mean, you know, uh, what can you do? How, how much you can keep uh, your uh, rebelliousness? Because he was rebellious when he was younger. If you live in such circumstances and you lead the, the architecture school at, at, at the Harvard, you know, it's hard. It's hard, I think. Anyway, someone placed uh, the big book on the Bauhaus here on the shelf. Of course, it wasn't him. It was the, maybe the photographer. I don't know. Well, he's, uh, so, I mean, here there were several successors at the Harvard. Jose Luis Sir was one of them. And uh, he also lived very comfortably. And uh, anyway. Um, I still think Walter Gropius' greatest achievement in his lifetime was the Bauhaus. As an architect, he had accomplishments, no doubt. But uh, I think uh, as, a, as a catalyst for a reform in education and for what he did at the Bauhaus uh, was, uh, was his, his best work, I'm, I'm inclined to think. Uh, this he did with uh, with Marcel Breuer, and this of uh, this one I, I talked from 1939. So uh, you know, before the war, it's a, it's a major effort, so to speak, in the domestic uh, realm, a big house. Uh, Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer. Maybe Marcel Breuer did the drawings. Probably this. I mean, look at this stair. You know, look at this parapet. You know, there are look there essays. Kenneth Frampton, Barry Bergdahl. And Charles Birnbaum, I don't know who Charles Bern, Birnbaum is, but Barry Bergdahl is, uh, was uh, Frampton's assistant and is now running the uh, curatorial work at the Museum of Modern Art in, in, in New York. And he's also himself now a professor at Columbia University. The Modernist Masterwork by Bal Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer. Uh, Yes, there are sophistications here, here not just uh, in the case of the staircase. Um, there is a complexity here, formal complexity. Look at this stair outside also. I hope I have another picture of it. Uh, so there is this one inside, but it's also the one outside, which is very interesting. Look at that dog. As I said, and I keep saying, is where a dog sleeps like this, it means uh, uh, the dog feels at home. And uh, <laughs> maybe the dog had uh, modernistic leanings, you know, and liked uh, Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer. It's possible. Sometimes dogs maybe are more wise than human beings, although <laughs> they could be. They could be sometimes. Uh, Frightening too. I know of such dogs at the edge of uh, Bucharest. Anyway, um, I hope I have images with this stair here on the right because it, it is a very fine work. Yeah, here it is. Uh, with simple means, in a way, you know, why do parapets have to be identical? No, they don't. And, uh, you know, the, this asymmetry that, that they created is engaging uh, aesthetically. Of course, uh, the snow adds to the drama. Now the Harvard Graduate Center in Cambridge, the Architects Collaborative, this was his, uh, his uh, you know, 
architectural practice, 1949-1950. Uh, you see the architecture is, is beginning to be a little bit, uh, something seems to be missing in my opinion. It's a little bit too you know, quiet and a little bit placid, I would say. Uh, yes, it's a curved world, uh, but nothing truly too uh, agitating. Uh, even the building in Dessau seems to be somehow a little more interesting than this, in my opinion. Anyway, this was Walter Gropius having the good life in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, there was no reason to be uh, too rebellious any longer. Uh, the University of Baghdad. <laughs> Baghdad also engaged the talent of Frank Lloyd Wright, unfortunately, because by, uh, by that time, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was rather, uh, you know, extravagant, uh, you know, in his early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and proposed some uh, curious things. And, uh, but this is what Walter Gropius did in 1957, 1960, uh, mosque, uh, uh, rendering, I don't know, is this a, a great rendering of a great building? I, I don't know. It looks a little bit uh, funny, sorry for the non-academic word, um, but uh, it was built and uh, then uh, allowed to deteriorate a little bit, but still, I don't know. I have seen m m much better mosques than this one. Uh, but this was uh, designed by uh, Architects Collaborative, and that is by uh, Walter Gropius, uh, Baghdad. Now the main gate, the University of Baghdad, Gropius plus um, TAC, what is that? There must be Architects Collaborative, the team of Architects Collaborative, I guess. Even this one, to my, in my opinion, is a little bit... Uh, you know, classicist, you know, this arch is it, strange in a way, you know, because I don't see in this work the author of that manifesto of the Bauhaus that I read in 1919 now. Now, it is not the same man. Uh, I mean, he is here in front of the, of the building, but the building is rather, I don't know, uh, conventional somehow. And uh, here he uses the same kind of thing on the top of the building, uh, this uh, tower, uh, also in Iraq. Um, I don't know, something happened to him. <clears throat> the John F. Kennedy uh, Federal Office building in Boston. In fact, I don't know exactly around what time Marcel Breuer uh, turned his back on his, you know, his great friend and, and uh, sustainer that is Walter Gropius. And that's when he opened his, I'm talking about Marcel Breuer, he opened his office uh, independently on his own in Manhattan. Maybe, maybe Breuer became a little bit disappointed with Gropius too, I don't know. Or he wanted, of course, his own path, uh, sign Marcel Breuer and not to live in the shadow of Walter Gropius. But now we look at the federal office building in Boston, 1963. Uh, Yes, yes, why not? But uh, could we say that the work is uh, strikingly original? I, I'm not so sure about that. We have seen uh, such uh, taller buildings, plenty of them in the United States, some of, with a remarkable quality. In fact, we saw some by uh, IMP just uh, two days ago. Um, Now, 1948, Peter Thatcher, uh, Thatcher uh, Junior High School. Uh, I don't know exactly what he did here. Here, you know, I, it's actually to me this air, this uh, this year seems to be uh, untrue because this is almost postmodernistic, or it was refurbished <laughs> and changed. But but here I I, I see uh, something of the 80s not of the, you know, 40s. Um, anyway, 1957, 1959, uh, again, the architects, uh, so TAC stands for the 
Architects Collaborative in uh, Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts, uh, house, uh, large house. Uh, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Okay. Important that it's the same one. It's Sorry. Someone is very interested in this presentation, of course. Okay, so this is a villa he built. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, 1958. Now, this is a major building by uh, Walter Gropius, the former Panam building. Now is the MetLife building in New York. And he worked with Pietro Beluski and uh, the project uh, project architects, also a famous firm uh, in, in in the United States in in, uh, in New York, Emery Roth and Sons, and it's uh, it's uh, it, it, it continues to be, in my opinion, a, a, a remarkable or remarked tall building in Manhattan. Um, it's um, its position also makes it uh, special. It had some opposition, but uh, it was built and it belonged to that uh, former, uh, uh, you know, flying uh, company uh, Pana. Uh, behind it, we see the Chrysler building, and tomorrow we'll we'll see some very tall and and uh, impressive buildings built by Shop the students of uh, Bernard Chumi and company at the Columbia University, uh, a remarkable uh, architectural firm, SHOP, S-H-O-P, but uh, the O, uh, small O, as opposed to the other three, which are capital. All students at uh, Columbia University, uh, all colleagues, uh, you know, the same age, two men and two women, and they got married and they founded this firm. Uh, and I had been in their house when they began, and I can tell you a few things about them. In the center of their living room, they had a, 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 a pool table. That's because just like Walter Gropius and Oscar Schlemmer and the rest of the Bauhaus, they understood the value of playing. And those people build a lot now, and uh, not badly, I would say. Okay, so we see the Panam building by Walter Gropius. Uh, and uh, here it is again. Now, Interbau apartment blocks. He was invited in Germany to build again in 1957. Berlin had a brilliant idea, and I think it's an idea which could be uh, uh, replicated in other cities. Berlin understood that it could only benefit if it invites the greatest architects of a certain time to Berlin to build a, a, an apartment building. So they did so in 1930s, they did so in 1950s, and here it was Walter Gropius, he built on that occasion an apartment building, and they did again in the 1980s. So now Berlin has three colonies with works by some of the greatest architects of the 20th century. If other cities would do something similar, they would become, uh, uh, you know, uh, touristic uh, attractions uh, and, uh, you know, uh, just like the Weissenhof in Stuttgart could, could bring great benefits to the city. This was the building built by, uh, by Gropius in its vicinity. There is a building by Oscar Niemeyer. Uh, in between them is the bu a building by Alvaralto. Not far away is a building by Bakema, uh, and uh, you know, so so there are, you know, a short distance from each other, some great buildings, and these are just from the 1980s. Even Le Corbusier built a unité d'habitation, to use the French uh, description, in Berlin, but not within this campus, far, you know, far away from it, but around the same time, in the 50s. Uh, Le Corbusier died in 1965. Um, and uh, on Thursday, when we'll talk about Cooper Union and John Haydock, John Haydock built 
in Berlin in the 1980s, a few, uh, you know, housing uh, units or, you know, two houses and apartment uh, building and so on. Anyway, I, I truly think Berlin uh, uh, did wisely to invite important architects to, to build. So this is the apartment building by uh, Walter Gropius, 1957 in, 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 in Berlin. He was probably emotional. This is the other side of the building with the circulations, the vertical circulations, the stairs, and here are the plans. Uh, a little bit hard to read the, the, the apartments, but... Uh, Now, uh, temple, a religious building, 1960 in Baltimore, Maryland, in my opinion, also a little bit too um, accommodating, so to speak, uh, not to say conventional. We remember that gate in Baghdad. Um, I don't know what to say about this, truly. Um, uh, you know, if we compare what he did in this field with uh, what, let's say, Le Corbusier did with the Pierre Saint Pierre de Firmini Fair in Firmini, or uh, not to speak about Ronchamp or even La Tourette, I think Le Corbusier was more creative than Gropius in his later years. I mean, really, when we look at this elevation, this is, it's hard to imagine that this is the founder of the Bauhaus, really. Something happened to him. Maybe life became too comfortable in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, uh, for him. It's possible. Now, the Gruppiustadt building complex in Berlin, uh, this is another uh, large uh, housing uh, scheme that he did for uh, Berlin later in 1960. Um, yeah, what can we say? Apartment buildings. A little bit curved, but the award-winning Wayland High School in Wayland, Massachusetts, but it, it was demolished in 2012 from 1961. <laughs> that you know, uh, we work hard to, to create a great building and then at one moment it's very possible that bulldozers will come in and uh, they will transform the, the building into uh, what, uh, what we see here. The embassy, of, the embassy of the United States in Athens, in Greece, uh, the architect's collaborative and consulting architect, this uh, Greek uh, architect, 1959, 1961. Uh, it's an embassy. It's 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 well designed, uh, but uh, it's clearly not a rebellious building. And of course, uh, an embassy cannot easily be a rebellious building. It's a correct building. Let's put it this way. But is it enough for a building to be correct? Maybe not. Anyway, um, the Glass Cathedral, uh, Thomas Glass works in Amberg. Now here is unclear to me, it's 1968. I don't know enough about this building. I don't think he designed this building. I, uh, and if he did, I, I would be very pleased because I kind of like uh, brutalismus and, uh, uh, you know, the building has force, has virility, but uh, I think he only did some, some intervention here and it's not very clear to me. Uh, um, I, I was actually very surprised when I learned that this, this is the work, I mean, it's, it's a work in which Gropius was involved because it's so different from the, the previous works done uh, approximately at the same time. But it's, 
Now, now this cannot be Walter Gropius. I don't know exactly what he did here. Uh, maybe uh, this is actually an interesting building, you know, this uh, elevated platform and uh, uh, I have to investigate further, but this building is associated with him and I see, I see here the glass cathedral and um, maybe I, I don't know if it, this was meant as a cathedral in 1968 in Amberg, Thomas Glassworks, I don't know what that is. But it's an interesting building, even if it is not his. Glassberg, yes, we can we can translate, we can read, uh, and we'll see another we'll see another work which was done after his death was accomplished. A large commercial work will arrive there. Uh, the, la the last uh, Gropius, last major project in uh, in uh, Tower East in uh, in Ohio, Shaker Heights, 1967-1969. Again, in my opinion, uh, rather pedestrian building in a way is not, it is truly not, uh, not a building that I like to associate with the founder of the Bauhaus. I mean, uh, North America has uh, plenty of towers, taller or um, about the same height, that are at least as good as this one, or at least as, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I hesitate to use the word, as this one. Anyway, this was done by Gropius, and uh, in 1968, the Huntington, Huntington Museum of Art in West Virginia, USA, original building expanded with Gropius addition with little alteration to the original structure, only American Art Museum to be brought to completion using a Gropius design. But again, I think here there is a melange of various architects. He probably worked on this part. I. I like to think that he didn't work on this part. He didn't work alone here. Um, it was just an addition. Probably this one. And you even wonder how much input he had because his team, TAC, the architects uh, collaborative probably did most of the work. And this is the last work I show and I was already uh, pointing towards it from 1973, 1980 was built after he died in Porto Caras in Greece, was built posthumously from Gropius designs. It is one of the largest holiday resorts in Europe, a commercial work, let's put it plainly. Here it is. I mean, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, similar designs, uh, not less good uh, at uh, Cap Aurora and other places. Uh, in the, you know, we are looking at the career of a very important architect, but an architect who somehow lost his uh, cutting edge towards the end. Uh, he became rather complacent, I would say. The works done in Berlin are probably more, uh, uh, you know, acceptable. But what he did here, but it's also hard to know because he was already dead when this was erected. So, but all in all, this was Walter Gropius. Let's wish him happy birthday. Let's appreciate him for what he did because he did a lot for the world of culture, for the world of art, for the world of architecture. And let's hope one day we'll have again a Walter Gropius, maybe less complacent towards uh, his, uh, uh, the end of his life. Uh, and uh, yeah, here is the 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 the, the conquering uh, commerce. And now we go to his protege, to uh, Marcel Breuer, a very interesting architect and designer. He never studied architecture, but he didn't need to, because he was uh, uh, um, he had the talent to uh, uh, manifest himself in design brilliantly from an early age. In fact, he was appointed a master at the Bauhaus. Uh, by, I think he was 22 or so after three or four years spent at the Bauhaus, 1902, 1981. And he was born, as I said, uh, on, on the 21st of May, three days from now in 1902. Uh, here he, here he is uh, standing with, uh, I don't know who the person on the right is, but on the left is Gropius uh, and uh, in the middle, of course, uh, Le Corbusier. Gropius, Le Corbusier and Breuer. Uh, 
Uh, here he is in his later years. Here he was as a young man in his later uh, years, uh, smoking. Today, uh, these days, very few architects smoke, but at that time, even the most celebrated ones uh, externalized their um, turmoils, inner turmoils, perhaps through uh, smoking. Here he is sitting uh, in an elegant, I mean, this is an elegant young man sitting in his Vasili chair that he created while he was at the Bauhaus. And as I said, initially it was named differently, this famous chair, but uh, since Kandinsky, who saw it, loved it, he created another one, he made it, handmade, uh, you know, a uh, second one, offered it to Kandinsky, and then an Italian company that produced, began to produce, uh, mass produce them in the 60s, they changed the name to Vasily chair. Anyway, Marcel Breuer and the invention of heavy lightness. I found this uh, description about him, and it's an oxymoronic one, of course, heavy lightness. But there is some truth in this uh, oxymoron. Uh, for example, in this library, you know, that he built in the States. Look at this, you know, brilliant uh, structure that is also somehow ornamental because of this uh, sculpturalness. And, uh, and uh, I am sure a very pleasing uh, uh, provocation within the, within the, within the library. 10 modernist homes by Marcel Breuer that will leave you with a bad case of house envy. <laughs> this is the, 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 the wording that I found on some site, you know, <laughs> interesting way to put it. So let's imagine that uh, some of you or all of you who attend this presentation will make houses that will leave us with a bad case of house, house envy. I didn't know that existed, that such an illness existed. You know, a bad case of house envy. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, so let's see. Marcel Breuer's house in New Canaan, in New Canaan, Connecticut, 1947, 1948. Uh, the man was doing well for himself, obviously, since he built, uh, and this is not the only house he built for himself. Uh, so uh, what can we say? I am beginning to already to have the bad case of uh, not only house envy, but other kinds of envies as well. Ay, ay, ay. <clears throat> it's hard to see so much, uh, you know, success. Uh, anyway, so it seems he even had kids. Uh, you know, uh, some people have it all, you know. Uh, not all, but some. And I wonder what he felt he left his uh, city in, in the fifth largest city in Hungary, PECS, at 18. Did he foresee his future then? Did he foresee what would come to him? Probably not. Okay. But as Erasmus uh, said, uh, fortune uh, always uh, uh, honors the audacious. So if you are audacious, if you are audacious, uh, uh, often uh, fortune smiles at you, but not always, unfortunately. Uh, fortune's, fortune, uh, fortune is uh, capricious. Okay, the Gropius house, he worked on the Gropius house as well. Uh, maybe he did more than just the drawings. 1937, 1938, uh, I don't know who did the landscaping, but uh, the landscaping is, is, is nice. I mean, Gropius also, in a way this explains why, why Gropius began to do those arches, because, you know, when you live in such conditions, you know, uh, maybe that uh, slight uh, amount of the ingredient we call suffering is not there any longer. So, you know, you begin to do arches. Um, in Baghdad and uh, in some other places. But this house is good. It's still good. It's still modern. It's still fresh. And you notice stone here. And Marcel Breuer was fond of stone. 
and uh, he probably appreciates appreciated Stone kind of like Lina Bovardi, who thought that uh, he even she even wrote an article called the Stones Against Diamonds. He valued she valued stones more than than diamonds, and I, I imagine Breuer also liked <clears throat> the the heavy stones. <clears throat> A brilliant tree, but this was not designed by Gropius nor by uh, Marcel Breuer. Geller House <clears throat> in Lawrence, <clears throat> Long Island, New York, 1944-1946. Uh, he also used wood sometimes. Uh, and um, uh, the, the fact that he didn't say no to organic materials <clears throat> makes his modernism more uh, sculptural, uh, even when he uses rectangularity or orthogonal schemes, because of the, the, the usage of or, or, organic matter, natural materials, uh, his, uh, his designs are not, uh, are not dry. Hello, Mr. Breuer. Uh, I actually had an interview in the office of uh, Marcel Breuer when I arrived in New York and I didn't even know I needed a portfolio. So I made some drawings with pastel, rough drawings on newsprint paper in a miserable hotel, Latham Hotel. I was very depressed and I felt alone and I didn't have money and <laughs> I didn't get a job. They thanked me, they thought I was very talented, but no, thank you. They didn't want me um, anyway. This is the Geller house in Lawrence. And you see the stone I, I was mentioning. I like that stone and I like that phone. Every time I have to answer the, 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 uh, the mobile phone, I, I, I think nostalgically towards this kind of phone. I wish we still had such telephones, even if they couldn't receive SMS uh, messages. Do you see this? this on the left, we have wood on the facade. On the right, we have stone. All of a sudden, these two materials bring something else to the building. If they were just, uh, you know, uh, dry, uh, whitish uh, walls, concrete or what, the building would have been different. But the fact that Breuer, you know, uh, enjoyed working with uh, natural materials makes a difference. Geller House too. Here is a different kind of house for the same uh, client, very different house, as you can see. Uh, he was playful and uh, sometimes maybe even a little, a little bit ir irresponsibly so, but I think a certain level of so-called irresponsibility is welcomed in art, certainly, and even in architecture. Maybe that's why uh, Tzvi Hacker said, a great building should be illegal by definition, should be illegal. Why illegal? Because it does something, you know, a betrayal somewhere, uh, because the little devil within the genius, the human uh, uh, genius is uh, at work and you, you do something that irritates the rules and the regulations. As uh, Sayar could say through Hernan Diaz Alonso, that school has its motto, to hell with regulations, we are going for the unknown. What a beautiful school. We are going for the unknown. And when you go for the unknown, you have the pleasure of the pioneer. You are an adventurer. Architecture becomes an adventure. You discover new things. Yes, you might uh, create some conflicts here and there unavoidably, but you discover the unknown. Not the known, which is already discovered, but the unknown. And I think this is the role of art in general, and I think it's also the role of good architecture to discover the unknown. 1969, this is the building that we just looked at with its uh, unusual uh, living room in terms of the, the roofing. Now the Kniffin House, New Canaan in Connecticut, 1947-1948. He wasn't always, he, sometimes he was repeating himself a little bit, but I like the presence almost always of the stone wall, a fragment, you know, and this makes me think of that uh, great uh, 
myth in Romanian culture, the Master Manole's ballad, because if you remember, uh, Master Manole didn't start to build his church anywhere. He only started to build it where there was a ruin, maybe a stone ruin, uh, and where a dog, a dog was, was barking. Very interesting intuition of the creator of that uh, anonymous uh, ballad. Why did Manole start his church only when he, where, where he heard a dog barking and where he saw a ruin? I think it has to do with the continuation. You continue something that preceded you. The ruin testified to something that was there before and the barking of the dog, let's remember the dog is the, uh, the companion of, 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 uh, of the deceased one, of the dead in the afterlife. So it has to do with memory, with a continuum on, continuum on the spiral of time. I don't know exactly why Marcel Breuer uses this, uh, you know, even fragments of a stone wall, but may maybe there was some kind of a, um, you know, reference to, uh, to that. Well, he didn't know, of course, the Manole ball ballad, but maybe there is something in our uh, collective unconsciousness that uh, crosses boundaries in space and time and who knows. But I think that fragment of a wall is significant, that stone wall. Uh, and uh, he uses stone uh, also, you see, uh, horizontally within the building. And he was wise to do so, I would say. A big house, another cottage from Rufus, Rufus Stillman in Connecticut, well, called college, uh, I mean, uh, cottage, but... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's actually, a, 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 I would say, a rather big house. It's, it's more than a cottage. But you see, he's adventurous with his structure and uh, uh, again, uses wood and, 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 and the organic material is, uh, is uh, gratifying. An interesting building, we have to confess. And even, you know, years after, it, is, it still has a level of freshness. I wonder what uh, the third master of the Bauhaus, that is Miss van der Rohe, would have said about this building or said about this building. I don't know. He was alive when, when Marcel Breuer built this building. And, you know, they used to be colleagues at the Bauhaus because uh, after he uh, finished his studies at the Bauhaus, Gropius asked Marcel Breuer to run the carpentry uh, workshop at the Bauhaus. So, you know, Mies, uh, Mies and, and, and Gropius and uh, Breuer and uh, Moholinog and all the, the other people, they were, they were uh, friends and colleagues. They knew of each other. There were also those at the Black Mountain College a uh, very, uh, you know, radical uh, arts college uh, in, in, in the United States where Ami Albers and Joseph Albers taught after they crossed the ocean, running away, uh, away from the Nazis. And, and, and they were formed and, uh, and uh, they even ran workshops at the Bauhaus. Brilliant exodus, no? I mean, I know I'm aware that I used today the word brilliant uh, quite a number of times, but it's almost unavoidable when you talk about these people. Museum of Modern Art Exhibition House, now in 1948, so just a short time after the end of the Second World War, he built this house on the grounds of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's clear that he already had the prestige necessary in order to be invited to, to, to build such an experimental house uh, for an exhibition process, uh, uh, purpose. The Caesar Court, uh, Cottage in Connecticut, Lakeville, 1952, he built a lot of houses. And, uh, and uh, at one moment he began to receive public commissions some of them quite large, including the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris. 
where he didn't work alone, it's true. It is possible that his upbringing in Hungary, uh, you know, his experience in Europe helped him to, 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 to arrive at uh, designs that were more, uh, um, in a way, more sensitive, less simplistic, uh, you know, nuanced by uh, natural materials and so on. There is a sensitivity which seems to be a little bit different from the typical North American uh, sensitivity although he adapted himself quite well to the uh, brave new world, as Aldous Huxley, Huxley will, would, would, uh, would call it. The Gagarin house, now I don't think it has anything to do with a, with a Soviet uh, cosmonaut. Um, anyway, um, who died young, unfortunately. Um, yes, fate is often unfair. What can we do? But again, we see the stone uh, being a loyal friend of uh, Marcel Breuer. And uh, he uses uh, this also often. Uh, he surprises us with uh, some sculptural uh, element within, within the rooms, within the building, like in that library that we saw. And we are going to see it again in detail. There was a sculptor in him uh, also, not just a furniture maker and an architect. A beach house in New Jersey, 1960. Modernist through and through. Another house, this time in Switzerland, 1963-1967 in Ticino. Um, his architecture is sometimes described as being brutalist. Uh, and maybe if you look at this exposed concrete, you would say, yes, that it has uh, a certain brutalist flavor, if, I, if, we can, uh, if we can say so. But I think the word brutalismus in German, you know, and there was a major exhibition two or three years ago called uh, SOS Brutalismus uh, that circulated between various cities. The word is a little bit inappropriate because sometimes some, some of the so-called brutalist works are actually sensitive works. They are not weak works, so to speak, but they, are, they, they, they hide a certain sensitivity behind the apparent brutality of facts or uh, the external uh, appearance of, 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 of the building. Marcel Breuer, our neighbor, no, from Hungary. Actually, I, I knew this, but Albrecht Dürer, apparently, he was born uh, uh, right near the frontier between Romania and Hungary. Uh, we are talking about one of the most important artists ever, uh, Albrecht Dürer. His father was actually born there, and I'm not sure about Albrecht, but he's anyway connected with, it's really two or three kilometers. In fact, you can walk, there is a town there, I forgot its name in Romania, you can walk to the town where the father of Adolf, uh, of, uh, of Albrecht Dürer was born. Uh, Mr. Dürer, uh, uh, senior, as he's called. Now a building in France, a Sayer house, Saye house, uh, apparently, he used this scheme often, where he has two opposing slope, sloping uh, surfaces uh, coming in the middle, and there you have the, the collection of the rainwater and so on. Uh, and this was done also by Kenzo Tange and other artists, you know, because the, this conflicting uh, uh, diagonals uh, create uh, indeed a dynamic. Uh, um, appearance to the building. Some uh, drawings or notations by uh, Marcel Breuer, and this is the house. Uh, we can speculate, we can see this also at, in the work of John Haydock on Thursday in Berlin. You know, the functionalist would say this is com complicates matters because snow accumulates here, rain, it's true, 
but maybe this uh, exactly this flirting with danger uh, adds something to the building, you know, a certain uh, uh, vivacity, I would say. So this work is in France uh, and uh, yes, the, the, the point where or the place where the rain and the snow converge towards could become sculptural and uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, eventful uh, presence within the anatomy or the physio yeah, the anatomy of the building. Marcel Breuer in France during construction. The Bauhaus Stout from 19, uh, he built it with the Walter Gropius uh, in Dessau 1925. We already saw, but we see other pictures of it, the Gropius house in Dessau and uh, refurbished in, uh, in recent times. Uh, there are some changes, as you can see, uh, maybe not so without significance. There is a difference, I would say, between this building and, and this one. Yes, the volumes are the same, but something, you know, look at the windows, you know, they become somehow too sleek and too, I almost felt like saying opaque, although of course a, a window cannot be opaque, but, but it's a different, it's a different architecture actually. Uh, I feel tempted now to talk about for three hours just about the difference between this picture and the previous one, but I will, I will, uh, I will not uh, drag you into this suffering. The Whitney Museum in New York, a major public building by uh, Breuer, and the building is still uh, gloriously there uh, and uh, very sculptural and uh, quite a presence. Uh, in, uh, in, in Upper uh, Manhattan. Here also we have the sculpturalness of certain parts of the building uh, and they, they, uh, they collaborate well, I think, with, uh, with, uh, with the artworks. Here is Mr. Breuer staring at us through the, one of the windows of the Whitney Museum. Uh, I have a monograph of Frederick Kiesler published by the Whitney Museum of American Art, where it says Friedrich Kiesler, Romanian architect, uh, uh, you know, working in uh, Vienna and Paris and New York. But, but his origin is traced to, to Romania, which something uh, Friedrich Kiesler himself didn't acknowledge. Shame on him, but otherwise, bravo to him, because uh, he is probably the most talked about uh, architect born in, uh, um, you know, uh, what the Whitney Museum said uh, was Romania, where he was born in Chernowitz, um, in the world, as far as I know, extremely appreciated in the West and in the United States, Friedrich Kiesler. He even taught at Columbia University, uh, the School of Architecture, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow, uh, uh, a course called uh, Corealism. Corealism, a uh, very nice word, because it's about bringing together, to correlate. Um, this was uh, Frederick Kiesler and his uh, Endless House, his most famous project. Here is again Mr. Breuer, quite a big window, that window. Uh, and uh, yes, culturalness, in my opinion, does add something to the building. But uh, you cannot mimic it. If it is genuinely uh, as it should be, uh, then it is a quality, otherwise uh, not. So this is the Whitney Museum of American Art, uh, this, uh, this, this building. And uh, I once did once, my, I did once myself, I remember now for storefront for art and architecture, I was invited to make a schema, like uh, an alternative design. I think uh, Renzo Piano, if I'm not mistaken, proposed something and it was uh, with some problems. And then uh, Storefront for Art and Architecture launched a competition or a call for entries. And I did myself, uh, I, I hope I can find the drawing somewhere. 
I don't know if I would do it the same way now, but I did something, I remember. Uh, anyway, um, moving forward with the Museum of uh, American Art in Manhattan by uh, Marcel Breuer. Uh, some, some people even consider this building as being a brutalist building. I don't think it is. Just because it has a, a clear cut uh, geometry doesn't qualify it to be so called uh, uh, brutalist. But I am Pei's work, some of his works were also considered uh, brutalist. Uh, what can we say? But it's a good building and uh, I hope it will live a long life. The Annunci Annunciation Monastery in North Dakota, 1963. Uh, he did some interesting works for, uh, you know, for uh, the so-called sacred uh, uh, program. Um, this is one of them, a monastery. Um, I mean, he was Jewish, but I think he renounced uh, his, uh, you know, form of religion in, in Germany when he was, uh, 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 when he had problems, I think his wife was also Jewish. And, uh, but he renounced, I read on Wikipedia, his, um, you know, form of spirituality or, or his religion. Anyway, he, he designed for, uh, for the Christian religion, uh, at least two buildings. This is one of them. And I think uh, he, he did a good job. I mean, uh, in, in my opinion, a good building uh, should transcend the specificities of uh, particular religions. Here he is. I don't know who this person is, and here are the, the, the clients. Nice. At least he doesn't have a hat on like Le Corbusier used to uh, when he was dealing with them with a, with a, uh, with the church figures. I wonder what Le Corbusier felt when he, he didn't take his hat off, even when he was inside a monastery or a church. Uh, anyway, St. John's Ab Abbey, Abbey Church and Bell Tower in Minnesota, College, College uh, Ville in Minnesota. Uh, this is also, you see the power of, of, of the sculpturalness of the building and the power of concrete. Unfortunately, we know concrete is provoking a lot of uh, uh, pollution, but um, uh, we cannot deny its, uh, its expressiveness. Although Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was an adversary of concrete, he wrote that concrete is a conglomerate. He used it too sometimes, but very rarely actually, and reluctantly. I think we have to appreciate that the United States received Gropius and Mies and uh, Breuer so well, and not just them, Herbert Bayer, Bayer and uh, Laszlo Mokolinogi and uh, Joseph Albers and his wife. And, but as architects, they were Gropius, uh, uh, Breuer, uh, Miss van der Rohe. And, you know, somehow bureaucracy didn't, uh, didn't um, cut their wings, so to speak, you know. I don't know how they handle these matters. I know that when Miss van der Rohe built the Seagram building, he didn't have the right to sign the, the drawings. So Philip Johnson signed them for him. Uh, I don't know what he did afterwards, but obviously uh, North America received them very, very well. They were already established because they had a fame that, that came with them from the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was the, the passport, the cultural passport towards uh, continuing growth uh, in, uh, in the States, professionally speaking, artistically or architecturally. Anyway, this is a good, another good building by, by Breuer and, uh, and I hope I have uh, better pictures actually. Um, Uh, 
a little bit hard to see here, but uh, anyway, uh, we saw the building. And what is good now is that, you know, this presentation is essentially just an invitation, an introduction to the work of the architect I talk about. If you are interested in the work, you can always uh, open, uh, you know, the internet and uh, you can find a lot of things to, to continue to study the work that interests you. It's a great, it's a great uh, advantage that we have really. You don't even have to go to a library now. You find almost everything on the web now, very generously and freely given to anyone. Uh, a powerful, I mean, you look at this uh, ceiling and the roofing and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's stern, but sculptural. Uh, so, you know, there are books published just, just about this building, as you can see. And it is beautiful to be creative, you know, and uh, I better not uh, return to my, uh, to my unhappiness about uh, why is it that uh, in, in, in Romania we do not build uh, creative churches. You know, it's so much uh, talent that is lost because there are Romanian architects who deserve, who could do, uh, you know, very interesting buildings and, 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 uh, and the church doesn't uh, invite them to. And it's very sad, I think. Anyway, uh, the University Heights campus at New York, uh, another interesting building by him, uh, an amphitheater, and look at the, the, the unusualness of the, of the facade. And uh, I, I, I think, and I, I, I don't, I, I, I imagine not too many people would be against such a statement that we all have surprises, you know, uh, unusual things, the new, you know, when something is, uh, is uh, uh, um, you know, uh, bringing a new perspective on a subject or a, a building brings something, uh, you know, I, 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 I think that a building that does not attempt to arrive at some kind of unknown is not honoring the adventure that architecture should be. Uh, I'm not against repetition. I think also great uh, architectural achievements were based on, on repetition sometimes, but uh, uh, no one can deny that the value of surprise, you know, uh, especially pleasant surprise, surprises. Of course, there could be also unpleasant surprises, but this building is a surprise, you know, as opposed to the building behind, which is not. And that one probably is not done by him. Um, Marcel Breuer, born in Hungary. It's not a big building, but because of its inner monumentality, it becomes, uh, you know, potent and, and uh, vivacious. And again and again, the diagonals are those that carry the uh, you know, the vivaciousness um, higher and higher. I'm a great admirer of diagonals. The problem is even, you know, sometimes if you live in a diagonal way, you'd have some, some uh, you know, some difficulties in life. I know something about them too. But look here, there is invention. No, look at these columns. Look at uh, look at this. You know, the, you you can tell that Marcel Breuer was not uh, following placidly the placid uh, path. No, he was inventing. Atlanta Central Library. Now this is the building that uh, has. I mean, look. In a way, it is similar to the Whitney Museum of American Art. 
it's a little more subdued. It's not maybe so, uh, you know, uh, extravagantly uh, moving towards the street, uh, but it has interesting parts. And uh, it's, it's, I think it has personality. It is a building that, uh, yes, it is cubistic. Yes, it has maybe some elements of what might be called the brutalist architecture, but it's not, uh, it's not an unpleasant building at all. Atlanta. Nineteen seventy seven, nineteen eighty. You see, it's described as being designed in the brutalist architectural style. I don't think Marcel Breuer would have been very happy to 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 read that uh, his uh, building is described to a so called style. St. John's University uh, Library. Here we have that structure that we saw initially. I mean, not initially, early on. And uh, I hope I have other pictures with it here, you know. Now you would say, why do we need this, uh, this concrete tree in the middle of the library? And I would say, why not? You know, in a way that this is the tree of life, uh, you know, uh, is, it, it, makes you, it makes your eye, uh, uh, you know, attentive. And it's a metaphor also for growth, you know, for... Uh, also, the relationship with uh, what we know about nature, about trees, about the trunk, about the branches, the oneness of the trunk from which several branches uh, spring out, and uh, it, it's it's not it's not an ornament; it is structural, but it also has an ornamental function somehow. That is an aesthetical uh, virtue or attribute. The building towards the outside, it is as it is. But since I mentioned surprise, that that element in the center means a lot. It's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's not just one. You see several uh, structural trees within the building. The building outside maybe is not as interesting, but those sculptural elements within the building are very valuable. I would say, and look at the in a way, the beauty of, of, of the plan, that is the ceiling plan there on, on the right, and you see the section. So even if the building is a box, but if it is animated from within by uh, powerful uh, structural elements, which are also aesthetically engaging and inciting, I think that is a good thing. Otherwise, the plan is not you know, it's not uh, exceptional if you look just here. But if you look here and if you look at the section, things begin to change. And the perceptions change. Now, sculpture is important. Art is important. Expression is important. Let us not forget what Louis Kahn said. Spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. Now, maybe Khan went a little bit too far away. You know, I'm not sure spirit can make the sun seem small, but it is important to express itself. Even uh, Stephen Hall said, if you have idealism in you, express it. Yes, don't let it slip or don't banish it, express it. And this is what Marcel Breuer did here. He expressed his idealism through these uh, concrete trees, powerful trees, if I can call them so, within the, within the library. Look even the staircase. The, scare, the staircase is often uh, the locus of sculpturalness and visual interest, and in this case as well. It's, 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 it's interesting. It is a surprise, and as such, it is a yes to life and to art as well, of course, and to sensitivity as well. This is in Australia. We are approaching the end of the presentation. It's a factory in, uh, in Australia. Uh, it appears to be blunt. It yeah. appears to be simplistic, but I personally like it. You know, it's, it's mysterious in a way in its, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bluntness.
Now, here I cannot say the same thing, but uh, who knows, uh, it's this fence and the other things in front of the building. Maybe the building would not have been so bad if these things didn't exist there. Anyway, maybe it's not his uh, masterpiece here. It's not one of, one of his greatest buildings, but it was built. <laughs> in a way, it's more interesting, this broken uh, metallic fence here, you know, with its disordered, uh, deconstructed uh, misery. Now, a department store in Rotterdam, uh, quite an interesting and large building. Here it is, you know, and uh, those who think that uh, we should only have structure, structure, and again structure, in this case, we clearly have ornament. Uh, what else is here? Uh, I don't know if it was exactly like this proposed by him, but it's very interesting, you know, unusual. I, I, I don't think there is another building like this one in the world. And mainly, it, this is bi-dimensional work. It's ornamental work at a large scale and with a certain uh, idiosyncratic, uh, uh, you know, attributes, if I can say so. But it, it's interesting. I, I like it. Uh, I don't know, in colors, it's a little bit obvious to see what we just saw in black and white. Um, maybe it's too busy what's going on here, and I don't know about this culture. But let's look just at the building. It's a big building uh, in, in Rotterdam. He loved hexagons. We have seen it before, and here they are again. You know, uh, but the hexagon, because of the number six, is uh, is uh, dynamic. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright used to work with uh, hexagons too in certain works, and he he was fond of, uh, uh, of of the hexagon. You know, with a hexagon, it's very difficult to stop. You know, it's like you 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 draw a hexagon and the second and the third and the fifth, and it it, it proliferates, and it it's almost impossible to to stop. And um, yeah, number six also is, uh, is an interesting number. And the hexagon, of course, has six uh, sides. And uh, I remember that my mother was very fond of something that later on I learned that she should not have been fond of, fond of, that between her birthday and my birthday, it was the fatidical number. But for her, it was not fatidical, 666. Because she was, anyway, no, I should not go now uh, into, into, into telling you what, um, what my birthday is. I stop. Please forget what I just said. Uh, let's come back to the hexagons of Marcel Breuer. Uh, here they are. Well, seen from afar, they are not so crushing or uh, even so obvious. You even wonder why did he do them like this, you know, or maybe they were done for the whole elevation and the elements, uh, you know, got rid of them of some of them, uh, I, I don't know, anyway. But I like this picture. It was not taken by Laszlo Moholinogi, but uh, it's still a nice, uh, I would say, artistic black and white picture. The UNESCO headquarters in Paris, he did this work too, together with a, a French architect, um, Zerfus, I think his name, uh, and uh, Pierluigi Nervi. I, I'm not very sure if this was done by Pierluigi Nervi or by Marcel Breuer or together. Unfortunately, this kind of building, uh, Marcel Breuer also built in the United States for a, a certain department of the American government. Uh, and uh, the critics uh, uh, criticized it because it was so similar to the UNESCO building in Paris. Uh, here we also have an insinuation of uh, you know, uh, I mean, we have the 120 degrees and uh, we are not far away from the hexagon. Uh, it, what can we say? It's a building. But, but not far away from here is the, I think it's here actually, a beautiful chapel by Tadao Ando, just a cylinder. Uh, I couldn't enter when I passed by here accidentally actually. But I, I regret I couldn't enter. Uh, a nice little building by, uh, by Tadao Ando. OK, and again, Alexander Calder with his mobile sculpture. Uh, and when we see you know, the, the, the collaboration between Nervi and uh, Breuer and Calder and uh, 
it, it's all about the artists and the architects coming together and taking revenge on a life which, which is for all of us uh, problematic, at least sometimes, not to, not to say other, not to say uh, even harsher things. I just said problematic. A look at this staircase. Um, this was, I don't know, done by Nervi, done by Breuer, done by both, done by the French architect, and he, his ghost name I should have known. Zerfus, Zerfus, something like this. Uh, furniture designer, and now we are truly approaching the end of the presentation. He built, as you know, the Kandinsky chair, the Vasily chair, and we see the the author um, uh, looking, uh, staring at us, uh, sitting on, on it. Uh, I like very much his boots. Uh, anyway, he, has, he had good taste, obviously. Um, a little bit feminine, but nice. Anyway, a real soul, probably. Vasily chair. This is the Vasily chair. I actually had two. I lost them somewhere in Sibiu. I think I deposited in someone's uh, attic or somewhere, and I forgot who that one is, or I don't know, they disappeared. I found them on the street in Evanston, Chicago. Somebody threw them uh, uh, but out of the house, but I don't know. I mean, you know, the, there was a mass production of this famous chair. It was with leather and, you know, steel and so on, but uh, I, I don't know, you know, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between the, the so-called original and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, a copy. I looked exactly like this, two of them, but they were so embarrassingly uh, modern and new that I, I tried to, to put one of these in my mother's house and it didn't look right <laughs> because everything else was so different. So I, I disassembled it and um, I don't know where it is, two of them. Anyway, he also did these um, rather different now from what we just saw. Um, and this, another chair by, by Marcel Breuer. Let us not forget, he was running the uh, carpentry uh, uh, department uh, at, uh, at the Bauhaus after he, uh, you know, he studied there for a few years. I don't know if he got a diploma or not, maybe yes but uh, Gropius asked him to stay as a master. This is a rather awkward chair, maybe also not very comfortable, but an, an experiment by Marcel Breuer. Why not? I don't know if you know, but Dan Hanganu also designed uh, some, some chairs, uh, the important Romanian architect who lived in Canada. In a way, surrealistic, very theatrical, very interesting chairs that uh, Dan Hanganu uh, designed and built. Uh, this is uh, kind of a chaise long in a way, uh, a long chair, so to speak, also by, uh, by Breuer. Maybe not as refined as those of Alvar Aalto, but still, uh, I think we can appreciate this design. And this one more, more uh, whimsical in a way, you know, with, uh, with those wheels. I did myself once a portfolio. I even applied for a patent in the United States for uh, um, uh, seats with a multiple coverings where I use these, you know, wheels and having, having the covering uh, like uh, used to be a film on rolls in analog uh, photography. And by moving the rolls, you would show a different segment segment of the of the um, of the of the covering. Anyway, I lost that portfolio for some reason, and I couldn't get the the, the patent because I had to employ a lawyer, and I didn't have the money for that lawyer, and I I, I just gave up. I worked with a Japanese architect on it though hard for an, a certain time. Anyway. Um, no time for nostalgia. Now we are concerned with uh, with um, Marcel Breuer. We are really approaching the end, and this is another picture. Even uh, Alvaralto has uh, actually very similar. Uh, the materials uh, Alvaralto worked with, he worked with wood, but um, otherwise in design maybe not too too different from what we see here um, at uh, Marcel Breuer. 
And here he is with very comfortable shoes, contemplating perhaps his, uh, his life and his uh, uh, work. And do you know who the, here is? Who is the person sitting on the Vasily chair? Who could this masked person be? She must be obviously someone from the Bauhaus, you know, uh, a professor, the, a master running a department. Günther Stolzl, who ran the weaving department, she, photo, she was photographed sitting in the famous chair by uh, Vasily Kandinsky with that uh, mask on her face, staring, uh, uh, staring at us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Good night. Thank you, Eric.